Hello everybody, this is Dr. Anna and today we're going to talk about the mass movement. Um, the mass movement or mass wasting, you, you hear it on the radio just like not too long ago we had that big big landslide in, in Oslo, Washington. Uh, so they call it landslide, they call it mass wasting, they could call it rock slide, whatever. But this just means that the downslope movement of rocks regulate and, and the soil under the direct influence of gravity will come down on the slope. It usually doesn't require transporting medium. It doesn't require um, a certain speed. It could be very slow or it could be very, very fast. So why is it so important? I mean, we just learned it uh, after this also Washington mudslide that, that it is very important because it's a very, very significant hazard uh, to people and property. And we have to identify where could it happen and what to do to be able to prevent it. So it's really, really important to learn the way it occurs, what kind of conditions required for it to happen so we can actually pre prepare ourselves to try to save property and people. Uh, yeah. So what controls the mass movement? The most important control is gravity, just like right here. But also, actually, the water is very, very important. The water is, like, significantly important because the water is the one which destroys the cohesion uh, or the internal re resistance in between the, the, the grains. And basically, this is what uh, creates the bu buoyancy for the mass of regolith to go down. Um, and also, if you have a whole lot of water in the slope, it also gives a lot of water weight to the slope. So it's, it's really important that you understand that it's, it has a double um, importance because it, on, it, it destroys the cohesion between the gray, so it helps for the mass movement to happen. And also, because it actually um, adds weight to the slope, which makes it easier for, for, for everything to come down. And as, as you remember, when the clay gets wet, it actually expands and it becomes slick. So therefore, it's easier for it to move down on the slope. So it's very important to understand these things. Uh, so this here shows you the controls of the mass movement. Uh, if you think about the gravity, it has two uh, parts. One is the, the one which is parallel with the slope, and that is basically what brings it down. And the other one is which perpendicular to the slope that actually helps for the friction. The friction is what holds it up. So the friction and the perpendicular component of the gravity holds the, the rocks up on the slope. And the other part of the gravity, which is parallel with the slope, which, which works against the, the these two. So if, if we call this G perpendicular GT, GP, and this is the friction, and this, let's say, is the GD, that's the, uh, the one which brings it down. So if this GD is larger than F plus GP, then we do have movement. We have movement. But if we don't, if the GD is smaller than the F plus GP, then we have no movement, no movement. So this is no, no movement, and that's GP, I hope you could read it. So you understand this figure, that the gravity has two components, one is what parallel with the slope, that's GD, and one is which is perpendicular to the slope, and that's GP. And GP works with the friction, that's what holds up the material, and GD is what pulls it down. So the slope composition is also very important. Right? We have two kinds of possibility. One is when it's solid rock. So when you dig down five centimeters and you have like a solid rock there, like if you go up to Windy Gap Mountain, basically you're sitting on granite. If you're in Roanoke, it's not the case. 
So if you have solid rocks, that's always a good news. However, you still can have weak, weak, weakness planes like um, tectonic deformation. You could have mechanical weathering like frost wedging. You could have sedimentary rocks with bedding planes. You could have soluble rocks which forms caves and sinkholes. Or you can have metamorphic rocks which are foliated. So if it, the foliation planes or the bedding planes sloping toward the slope, then you easily can have mass movement even though it's solid rocks. However, remember having solid rocks is always a good news. Then you have to see what kind of weakness planes are and if the weakness planes is parallel with the slope, because then it's more dangerous than if it's if it's against the slope. As I was just talking about that if you have the weakness plane and it's parallel with the slope like right here. See this is the slope direction, this is the hill itself. So this is the slope direction. When the weakness plane is parallel with the slope direction, then it's bad because if you put weight on it, it makes it easy to, to slide down. On the other hand, if the weakness direction is actually, um, I'm changing the color, opposite, like the weakness direction would go like this, and that's the slope, then you know it would help a whole lot. So you wouldn't see as much movement as when the di weakness direction is parallel with the slope. On the other hand, when the slope, slope is uh, consists of unconsolidated material, which means basically soil, because that's what it is, or sand, if you are close to the beach or something, then we have a couple of choices. When the slope is dry, means that I, there is no rain, then the slope is pretty stable. Uh, and the maximum angle of the slope when it is still remaining stable is the so-called angle of repose. And the angle of repose uh, in dry sand is about 30, 35. Remember when you were a little kid and you played in the sand? I hope you do. When you played with the dry sand, all you could do is just a little hill, kind of. What did you have to do to make a nice castle? Nice castle. Remember, you have to put just a little bit of water to be able to build a castle. So just a little bit of water is going to make it even more stable. And when you put too much water, it's actually running away, kind of, you know, it washes away really quick. So that is the, the important uh, with the water. And the other thing is that depending on what kind of grain size you got, the angle of repose is changing. So in dry sand, it's about 35 to to um, 30 to 35 degree. If you have gravel on the other hand, it could be as high as 45. I've got another slide which shows you right there, so it's it's okay. Yeah, this here shows you clear that if you have just fine sand, it's 35 degree. If you have coarse sand, it's like 40 degree. And when you have gravel or, you know, which is basically angular pebbles, it's much steeper. So if you climb up on a gravel slope it can be much steeper than if it was like a sand, a sand hill. And this here, you, you can go out and take pictures of this kind of uh, gravel uh, pile and saying that this is the angle of repose, remember for your picture project. Now the vegetation has a very very important role because the vegetation, when you plant the vegetation, it has roots and the roots actually tend to hold the slope together. So depending on what kind of vegetation you put, the slope can be more or less stable. But definitely if your slope is sensitive, which means it's mostly clay. Clay is the most sensitive slope. That's very important to know. Clay equals sensitive slope. So when you have a sensitive slope and you have to build on it, then the best thing you can do to yourself is put deep-rooted vegetation on it, such as grass. Remember, have you ever tried to dig in grass? Grass is going to make it really, really hard, so it's almost impossible to dig in grass because the grass has such a deep root system that it really holds the slope together really well. Like whenever they make a road cut, the first thing they will put down is that green grass, remember? So vegetation is very important. 
also if you put uh, trees which have really big leaves that puts like a canopy over the sensitive slope so basically you can have uh, a much better chance of not having mass movement if you have like trees with big leaves so that's very important too and this is where you learn about how important the water which I already mentioned so when you have a dry sand it's gonna make the 35 degree angle when you put just a little bit of water I said it funky just a little water you know the the water actually because of the high surface tension of the water it will basically glue the grains together so it makes it really good easy to shape and it stays up like that so you can make the, the sand castles on the other hand if you put too much water then actually the grains can roll on top of the water it loses all the cohesion in the in the sand and basically it just will wash away and you play that sand uh, when you were low on the beach and you know when you run back and forth and brought too much water your low sand castle just got washed away so the water has very important role and that's what teaches us like if you have a slope which seems like really stable you don't know if it's going to be stable if you got a torrential rain and most slopes will not be stable when you get a torrential rain like in Nelson County 1964 there was a huge hurricane Hurricane Camille which which dropped like 25 inches of water in one day 20 in less than 24 hours 25 inches and half of Nelson County have died of mass movements basically just like the mudslide in Oso County Washington just which happened this weekend I mean it was crazy that's just a nice picture of a, a nice looking sand castle and we're ready to move on to the what sets off a mass movement. We have two kinds of uh, possibilities. One is which naturally happens and we cannot do much about it. We can prevent, we can try to help with the natural uh, mass movements. However, the human-induced mass movement, which is the second one, we definitely can help with. So the natural settings, um, the natural triggers, the first one is the torrential rain, and that is always an... Uh, example right behind it then when I say torrential rain uh, it's about the same as as I just mentioned the hurricane um, Camille in 1964 in Nelson County 24 inches in one day you could also have earthquake when you have an earthquake that can really easily initiate the mass movement uh, and then the volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruptions are really dangerous because usually these tall mountains like Mount St. Helier, Mount Rainier, Mount uh, Adams, Mount Hood, they have snow covered on because they are higher than 2,000 2, meters and the snow line is about 2,000 meters. So above that, you always have snow. If the volcano erupts, you know, the snow melts and it picks up all the rocks on the side of the volcano as a lahar goes down to the valley and causes a whole lot of damage. It's called Lohar. And there is a landslide which was triggered by a big earthquake in Alaska. This is another one, a mat flow from Tajikistan. And this here is a, a very important thing that you should know about that when you have a, a forest fire basically when the trees burn what happens if you have a sensitive slope like in this case when you take the canopy off of it which means the trees burn down you basically have an exposed sensitive slope to any rain and if you have rain you know this whole side will come down easily like there is one here it's a it's a pretty basic, uh, amazing landslide, which I shouldn't say amazing because a lot of people must have died here. Um, so, yeah, you have to be careful. Just because the view, view is nice, you don't necessarily have to move on the side of a mountain where you know that mudslide can happen anytime. Like, there is this one. This is the La Conchita mudslide. Uh, and you can clearly see that before they started to build this um, subdivision, you could see that there are 
uh, areas of, of mass movement right there, previous ones, you can clearly see it. And actually they saw that there are problems here, so they put a retaining wall. That itty bitty teeny tiny retaining wall against the whole big mountain. I mean, just think about it. Of course, look, the retaining wall went away just like that with the mudslide. So if you think that you're going to be safe because there is a retaining wall behind you, I'm just telling you, you are not going to be safe. So you better make sure that you do not move underneath of a big mountain when you see this previous mass movements right there you can wherever if you if you travel on 81 toward uh, the north like Winchester and you can see the Blue Ridge in the distance and you can see areas where the trees are missing that's always the sign of mass movement in that area that's why the trees are missing there like if you look at the distance here the trees are big time missing of course because it was a previous mass movement look at this slide this is the same, but from another view. See how many houses went under? I mean, it's just crazy that people move into areas like that. Now, these are the human-induced triggers. And the human-induced triggers are the ones you can actually do. It's, it's, it's humans are responsible for those mass movements. And there is like a couple of ways I wrote down here. One is when you actually have a farm on a slope which is happened to be sensitive like every soil and um, one year you decide that you're gonna change the plant and you're gonna plant a different one without thinking of what kind of root system it has so as soon as you have shallow root system and you want to water your plants you have to start thinking about mass movement because it happens it happened in France it, it's in the book a very good example now, what if you over steepen your slope? Like, let's say there is this, this is your original slope and you cut down for a base, you know, for a house. What, what did you just do? You over steepened it right here and then you put a weight on it. So basically this is absolute mismanagement. And then what if you over irrigate? That just means that you water your plants on a sensitive slope then you can have the whole slope going down or you install leaking septic system but remember every single septic system is leaking because what happens here you have the the big tank which collects the the solid waste and then from there the pipes are going out it's per, per Ford, which means it has a lot of holes and the water which doesn't have the the big uh solid waste will actually seek into the ground. And if your ground is not so good, you know, it can easily over irrigate it, just like an over irrigation system. The other thing is that it, when, when clear cut for acid slope, we talked about that already. Or if we cut into the basis uh, of, of uh, sensitive slope for building houses like here. And mass movement can also eat in, initiated with uh, quarrying in some quarries, you know, and blasting for, for quarrying, basically. So you have to be careful about that. So these are just a couple of, uh, like a picture showing these we just talked about. Like here is when they cut the slope, you know, like they cut the slope, they make roads and they steepen it even more. They put the house which puts waste. And then they over irrigate it. So when you when you sprinkle the grass, basically you over irrigate the slope. Okay, I'll continue in the next segment.